Okay, so we are in this screen called uh, Cloud and DevOps uh, Hands on Mastery, right? So this is the brochure. So, did you get a chance to go through this? Yes. You have gone through this already, right? Yeah, I have gone, gone through already. So, I have taken notes for the basics of uh, DevOps fundamentals and Linux comments. Mm, right, okay. So, this week, or maybe you know, in the first session, we are trying to actually cover this uh, getting started. Uh, where mm -hmm. there are bundles, Linux, uh, virtualization, scripting and programming, and software engineering foundations and the cloud basics. So this itself is actually a huge module. Uh, so so today we are actually starting with uh, a topic which is not actually listed here. Okay. Just about, uh, uh, the DevOps story. So let me mm -hmm. just. Stop sharing the screen now and uh, get back to the that PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Now you can see the PowerPoint presentation opening slide, right? Midi books, the DevOps yeah. store. Yes, right? Midi books. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I just created this story to actually walk you through a natural progression or maturing of a uh, company, an IT company, which started as a startup, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, a business idea, or a, a turned into a software product. And eventually, mm -hmm. this startup went into a big uh, global healthcare powerhouse mm -hmm. with the help of uh, DevOps and Cloud. So I'm just faking a story. So this is a totally imaginary story. And uh, okay. I'm trying to connect all the evolution of a company through the DevOps and Cloud, or even the DevOps implementation or maturity model. Have you heard about the DevOps uh, maturity model? So you might have heard about CMMI, right? Yeah. CMMI. So that is actually a maturity model for uh, different types of companies, including IT companies, uh, for their professionalism, uh, for their ability to deliver services to the clients uh, predictably and uh, within the budget. Yeah. So similarly, yeah. DevOps is also a an, an evolution for the companies. Mm -hmm. The DevOps evolution of the companies goes through uh, various stages. So through this story, I'm trying to actually mimic or maybe you know draw a picture about uh, how this happens in a typical company. All right. Okay. Okay. So here, this story is like uh, so: a software developer, a young software engineer called Arjun, who is mm -hmm. from Bangalore, typically you know the IT hub of India. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, he went for a, a medical conference or a healthcare conference in Dubai, and he met uh, one doctor, Amina Rashid, and uh, over there. And so he met. So he went as part of you know meet, meeting uh, different people in the IT industry and even the uh, you know yeah, the scope for IT industry. So for for part as part of his business development. So he didn't have a company or something yet. So he just roaming around. So he met her, and um, so this Amina Rashid discussed her uh, struggles. Uh, so she, she's a uh, an experienced doctor, hmm? and she's running a clinic. And uh, in her clinic, uh, she, she is actually taking a lot of patients, and she had a lot of struggles for making the appointment booking yeah, and managing the consultation and everything. So she discussed all the struggles with him. Uh, and she wanted a digital system to streamline the appointment booking process you know, uh, so that uh, yeah, she can actually take more, more patients and even uh, she can actually streamline everything and she can make the whole process very easy. Yeah, so everything is traceable. So this was her requirement. So what Arjun did is like a, he taken up this as a side project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he agreed to solve this problem using technology. Uh, he's a very young uh, software engineer. So he's very mm -hmm. confident about his abilities to actually solve any business problem into technical solutions. So so he found this as an opportunity uh, to build a product called Medibooks, a solution that would streamline the whole appointment booking process. So initially, this was a very small system, which came up with a business problem. So this is the only idea uh, in these first two uh, slides. You know, so okay. eventually, this the whole story is about this how this product goes through different phases and uh, becoming a uh, big company, big IT company. And all the struggles, okay. the struggles he and his team goes through uh, on this process of uh, growing the growth phases. 
right? Mm -hmm. So okay. the summary is that he got into an agreement with this uh, Dr. Amin Rashid, and uh, uh, he started developing his uh, this product as a solo developer. Mm -hmm. so he's the only developer in this case. Okay, and okay. the product okay. is called uh, MIDI Books, and he started the initial version of it. Mm -hmm. And it was a web-based platform for appointment bookings. So a typical okay. Java-based backend, Java and Spring Boot backend, and with a PostgreSQL database and uh, mm -hmm. Angular frontend, Angular web application on the frontend. So a very simple application he started with. Okay? Okay. And he did the initial version. He built the initial version and he presented to the team, the customers. You know, so, so he went to the clinic of this doctor and he presented to the team and uh, uh, they were impressed with the results so he covered pretty much most of the uh, requirements they they were facing or the problems were facing so they got the solution so they agreed mm -hmm. to a pilot run of that system mm -hmm. and they signed a contract for the further development so that's the story so mm -hmm. he was the first customer and it is on production and they they agreed to start the system so this is the typical scenario of any product which launches, which goes to the first customer. So they get initial mm -hmm. feedback from the uh, customer. They start using it, they find more problems and more requirements. If it works perfectly, they will get more requirements. And so it will grow. So this is the show. Yeah. So okay. what this Dr. Amina Rashid did, did was, since she was happy, she referred to more customers. So Arjun started getting more customers. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm more referrals and he started getting more customers and uh, you know then that means more business and more problems yeah so now he cannot actually so initially uh, when if, if we look back this system so this system was <laughs> running on a small server so he hosted it on a small server like godaddy hmm? okay so that's the upcoming slide that's it so and it was just you know one single installation for a clinic or a doctor okay so i'm not sure about uh, your technical background so if you are unable to catch some technical point or any scenario just stop me in the middle and ask me the questions okay so that's how we should sure. okay sure sure yes initially he hosted only for one doctor so mm -hmm. if another doctor another clinic wants the same product he wants he mm -hmm. needs to actually deploy it on another server and configure mm -hmm. for that clinic and uh, register and onboard their users and configure all the uh, patients and everything uh, all the other staff members and users of that company that clinic so it's all separate okay. individual separate independent systems yeah from that that's it so that's not a scalable model okay so in order to make it sale scalable he thought about a software as a service system. Have you heard about the SaaS model? SaaS software. Yes. As yes. Uh, yeah. For a very good example is Google uh, email itself, Gmail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a SaaS model yeah. system, right? So he decided to convert it into a SaaS system so that he deployed in a central server, and everyone mm -hmm. have their own tenancy. So this is a multi-tenant SaaS model system. So every mm -hmm. every clinic can come and sign up. They can create their account. They can create. Uh, the, uh, their, they, they can invite their users. So they will feel this particular customer or subscriber. They will feel as if this is their. They are the only customer in that system. When we use okay. email, we feel that okay, this system is only for me, so because it mm. has clear isolation from all other users, all other companies. Mm. Yes. So, so he decided to scale it up into a SaaS model system. That actually invited and uh, allowed uh, so many users to come and sign up in a self-servicing model very easily. So it started growing. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. got the scalability required, the initial scalability required. So the decision he has taken is he, this was a multi-tenant SaaS system. And he wanted to actually develop. Now he has a scope for in the comprehensive healthcare platform because uh, every new user is coming up with the new requirements. Hmm? Yes. yes. Yeah. The system has to grow in terms of user, uh, the capacity, the server capacity, and even in terms of features. Yeah. So okay. Arjun 
cannot, uh, you know, he, he is unable to actually uh, scale it further with a single developer called Arjun. He wants to develop a team. So he wants to hire more mm -hmm. people. Yeah. So he's expanded the team. So he hired two guys. One is one Sophia, who is an Angular mm -hmm. superstar. Here she's a UI expert for the front end development. And another guy called Omar. Uh, he's a back end Java developer. So that you know, uh, Arjun become the technical lead, or many people. He, you know, he, he can lead uh, team members. He can give direction. Mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. So it didn't stop there. He has to actually. He had to go multiple rounds of expansion. So he wanted to hire an QA engineer, QA engineer, okay. testing quality in the quality assurance. You know, and uh, he wanted a business analyst to actually talk to the customers in terms of business. And he wanted okay. more. Okay. Right. So his team expanded. So this is a typical mm -hmm. expansion of any successful startup. Okay. So he expanded okay. the team. So now he started facing many challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So initially, when he was a single solo developer, he didn't need any uh, source control mechanisms or anything. He he would be able to develop on his own local PC, deploy it, you know, pull well, everything, build everything, package everything, and finally deploy into um his local machine or and then just finally copy paste to the godaddy server uh, easily so it was easy at that time and th that was the easiest method and he okay. didn't have problem of uh, maintaining multiple versions you know mm -hmm. but when whenever the moment the second developer joins then there's a problem of code conflict because both of the guys yes. are on the same code base same project yes. Uh, yeah. Probably sometimes it might be the same page itself, same, same file in different places. Yes. And yes. one, and when the team expands, there are scenarios where uh, one or two people are developing for next release. The mm -hmm. other two are developing for the air release after the next release. You know, yes. So there are two different clients with two different requirements. Both of these clients, the requirements are urgent. They wanted it tomorrow or next week. So mm -hmm. they need prioritize for both of them and they need to run the development in parallel so yeah. all these things are actually coming up and so without a source control system they cannot handle it that's the scenario yeah. right yeah yes. so the challenges he faced were co code integration from different people and code mm -hmm. conflicts when they integrate the code so yeah did mm -hmm. you feel, or are you aware of such scenarios have you tried uh, writing any source code uh, so are you able to follow what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, for the team collaboration, we are using uh, Git, Git or yeah. GitHub. So, so there know, uh, we can identify the code. So where we uh, uh, initialize the Git, uh, the code uh, initialization and uh, the further steps, everything we can track it in our Git. I can understand. Perfect, perfect. So you can follow. So you have the experience. So you understand the points, like code integration, yes. code conflicts. Yeah, yeah. Even the code quality, because every developer is developing or writing the code in a different style. So yes. whose code is better? Whose code is better? Whose solution is yes. better? And uh, are yes. we following a certain standard? So code quality issues. Yeah. And yes. there is no organized development workflow. Well, if you are working in a team, so mm -hmm. uh, where do we start? And where do I hand over to the next person? And who will review? Mm -hmm and when to review and when to build and deploy how to write the test cases all those things come under the development workflow so it was not defined so they they, want, they wanted a structured system of development yeah so the needs are like source or source control or version control system like git yeah and a centralized course code repo so that everyone can commit and push that code and then integrate to a CI CD server or, or a central place, you know, and code review, yeah. collaborative development and development workflow. So these are the needs. And the solutions, they came up with the first set of DevOps uh, solutions. So they didn't realize that, okay, there is a need for DevOps now. So these are the initial requirements or initial entry, silent entry of a DevOps into the system. So the first entrant was Git uh, as a source control system and GitHub as a central repository. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. both allows them for to collaborate and do the code reviews, and as a process, they want to work together as team uh, effectively, right? So for that, they have uh, adopted agile methodologies like a Scrum, okay. Kanban, and XP. Are you are you XP. aware of these guys? Scrum, Kanban. Yeah, and yes. Yeah, I'm aware of Scrum. Scrum, right? Okay, so you might have a high level idea about the Kanban as well, 
right? Oh, sorry. So you might have a high level idea about Kanban as well. If, if you have yes, Scrum, yes. Scrum, okay. Yes, Scrum and Kanban and XP is extreme programming. Have you do you know that XP, extreme programming? Um, uh, I'm just know the basics. I haven't worked uh, so far, so I I have just taken a notes about uh, the agile methodology and what oh. are the tools and technologies used before. So I know oh. the basics. That is good enough. That is good enough. Basically, we, we don't need to master all of this, but we need to know, okay, these things exist. And yeah. originally, DevOps actually came up from these and uh, these methodologies. And there's a lot yes. of convergence. There is a lot of overlaps, and they need to work together. So yes. in a development team, um, DevOps is being used by a modern development team, where that modern mm -hmm. development team use Scrum, Kanban, and XP for their daily, uh, daily work, for the software development work. So it's all a mix. It's all it. It it should be a perfect blend of all these methodologies together. That's the idea. Yeah. So next. Now uh, we said that okay, he Arjun was actually deploying it into GoDaddy because his system was very small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so initially it was good, and it's it was in a shared hosting server or even a shared hosting virtual machine. Yeah. So initially everyone as a uh, initial MVP, minimum viable product. They start with a GoDaddy, GoDaddy account. Uh, generally, yeah. uh, early stage, they didn't go uh, and use a cloud server or even a digital cloud, digital ocean or anything, nothing. So it was just GoDaddy. That was the easiest one. So he's, <laughs> he started facing the problems, unable to cope with the increasing demand and user base. So scalability issues, increasing users, you know. So. The, it was unable to, so there was no provision to actually manage uh, the number of, uh, manage the load, you know, load mm -hmm. of the servers or the virtual machines. So there is no scalability. So it uh, okay. resulted in slowdowns and bottlenecks using the, during the peak time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it started affecting the user experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there were okay. many crashes, many downtime. Mm -hmm. So he started facing the problem of uh, GoDaddy or the such uh, system, such uh, hosting servers. Yeah. So it started affecting mm -hmm. the customer trust. Yeah. So the need for the moment is a scalable infrastructure. So he wanted okay. to upgrade the infrastructure. And uh, mm -hmm. that infrastructure should grow with the increasing number of users at peak hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And okay. it should be, there should be a reliable mechanism. So he should be able to configure the reliability, configure the okay. scalability, all the stuff. You know, so so he wanted such a system. So the cloud mm -hmm. comes into the place. Mm -hmm. So the okay. solution is cloud. So he wanted to actually migrate to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he selected uh, AWS because that was the most okay. popular. And he tried mm -hmm. and he did some uh, initial experiments and he migrated it. So he himself, Arjun himself, he was a techie. Yeah. Okay. He set up the account. He created the account. He set up the identity and access management. Then, yeah, do, do you have any uh, connection or any previous experience with any cloud, any of the cloud providers like AWS, Azure? Yeah, or... infrastructure. Uh, like uh, for the infrastructure, we uh, we I used Terraform and AWS CloudFormation to automate the infrastructure deployment configuration, uh, such right. things. So right. I had experience with those both. All right. Okay. So you so you know what I'm talking about now. Okay. Cool. But so yeah. he said. I am. He created the VPC, virtual private cloud, and the security mm -hmm. groups. And so he did the initial networking configuration and everything. And the developers moved the application server. So since it was a Java application, it was hosted in a. It was running in a, inside an Apache Tomcat server. And so mm -hmm. from the Daddy server, he moved it in an EC2 instance, EC2 instance okay. in AWS, uh, which was on Amazon Linux. Linux, okay, and he. Okay. From the traditional database into an RDS relational database service in uh, AWS. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the front end developer Sophia, she moved uh, the front end application, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually running in an Nginx instance. Nginx is another web application so web server, web server yeah. for uh, JavaScript applications, uh, even uh, uh, Python applications. You know, so since it was a this thing, the Angular application, uh, whose fundamental foundation is in uh, Node.js. The runtime was in Node.js. Uh, the, okay. Not the runtime, the hosting place was in Node.js. Uh, so it moved into the Nginx. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and uh, so it can run inside Nginx and uh, another EC2 instance. So there are two EC2 instances. And he configured the auto-scaling group for the scalability. 
he configure let's say for example uh, three instances initially okay uh, with a very small configuration and made it you know expandable so he uh, said okay uh, if it exceeds 85 percentage then grow maybe to a maximum limit of 10 instances for example okay and uh, you know so the minimum is three maximum is 10 so he configured and everything and uh, everything was configured manually that's a highlight here everything was configured manually he went to mm -hmm. the admin console and he was doing everything by himself yeah so no automation mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. key at least the system is now on cloud so it is scalable to a limit to an extent right so what are the benefits okay. realized by this cloud migration so the performance issues and reliability scalability issues are fixed yeah and uh, it can handle you know, more number of increasing number of uh, traffic and data so it started okay. the number of instances would grow as the number of users grow on the peak hours on the off peak hours it will reduce so it became elastic right mm -hmm. and uh, now future proofing so at least they got a very good solid foundation so they can build on top of that so they can start leveraging uh, the benefits and advantage of advantages of uh, cloud although they are using the very minimal stuff yeah so now there is a very solid groundwork for the future expansion and innovation in cloud okay it's on cloud so okay now next you know now there are operational challenges we said okay everything was okay. being done manually no automation right so <laughs> more yep. uh, the a typical uh, application like uh, like this a successful application with a growing number of clients will definitely bring up uh, every day they will come up with a lot of new feature requests yeah and mm -hmm. the number of users will increase so the users were not just the patients the and not, not just the uh, internal users there are a growing number of patients uh, yep. growing number of clinic growing number of internal users like uh, doctors nurses admin staffs and everything so more features like a more security more roles user roles mm -hmm. uh, more mm -hmm. isolation more authorization and uh, access controls everything and operational complex complexity you know uh, so more number of clinics means everyone needs to release a new feature every day or every week you know very frequently yeah, yeah. yeah. so remember yeah. we just migrated to cloud there is no automation here mm -hmm. so yes. and then when the more number of uh, more number of uh, users means uh, th there will be a lot of uh, you know uh, overlaps of the features from clinic to clinic so one mm -hmm. clinics or one hospital's requirements may affect another hospital's requirement yeah, you know so a, an application a module or a service was actually working perfectly until a mm -hmm. clinic came up and they started adding new features and then it started affecting others so quality issues, performance challenges because of the growing number of users. And again, demand for frequent and faster releases. Everyone wanted to release the new feature today. So this is a typical exactly. yeah. And so the dev team. So currently at this moment, there is no operations team. Operations team okay. and everything, we use the same uh, developers and everything. They would develop the features. They would talk to the customers. They would develop, they would test, they would release, they would uh, monitor. Uh, you know that there is no real monitoring facility and everything so this is a chaotic situation in an early stage mm -hmm. of Apple startup so they started facing all these operational challenges you, okay. you can imagine now right yeah yeah so that is the moment they started they started thinking about a devops engineer they wanted someone to mm -hmm. handle typically in the uh, old times it was not a devops engineer they would hire a release yeah. manager maybe an operations team would uh, you know or, yeah. or maintenance team previously it was maintenance yes. team since uh, Arjun was a very, you know, uh, progressive guy and he was of a new generation guy, he knows that, mm -hmm. okay, they, he needs a DevOps guy who can manage okay. uh, the operations area as well as he can coordinate and collaborate with the development team. So he hired a new DevOps guy. And this guy, apparently, he was a Chinese guy. His name was Lee Chen in Bangalore. <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> this, this can be, a, we can typically say that, okay, he hired someone from Shanghai. You know, and this okay. guy is working remotely. So at this age, we can handle everything remotely, right? So he can connect and so he got he got a guy and he's a seasoned, a very experienced DevOps engineer. Mm -hmm. And his mission, his task is actually to automate and optimize Medibook's development life cycle. Because he clearly knows that okay, the 
the first task would be to you know streamline the development workflow development workflow mm -hmm. means the delivery cycle mm, with yeah. a fun process for so that he wanted actually as uh, an experienced guy who has gone through all these stages and you know he came up with the solutions yeah and apply, mm -hmm. apply the devops methodologies into the uh, development life cycle so currently everything is an unorganized manual way of doing now you mm -hmm. with the power of devops he wanted to automate and apply the tools and reduce the manual efforts and reduce the errors and here he can up he can achieve faster delivery which are the goals yeah. now uh, one of the first steps was they introduced uh, jamie uh, sorry uh jenkins yeah jenkins yeah. yes jenkins for building the ci cd pipeline they they wanted to eliminate or stop uh, the manual copy paste deployment previously they were just copy pasting or maybe you know they were doing scp yeah yeah secure, secure copy run right so uh, which yes. was creating a lot of issues so there was no version control for the deployment the automated way there was no predictability yeah so mm -hmm. they did and uh, created a ci cd pipeline and the yeah. benefit realized for rapid and reliable integration and delivery ci continuous yeah. integration and cd continuous delivery both of them were achieved mm -hmm. and it accelerated the development process with a button click or maybe a hook maybe a push yeah. file commit to a branch a specific branch main branch for example it triggered mm -hmm. all the life cycle including the uh, building packaging testing and finally deploying and everything so they mm -hmm. automate the whole process mm -hmm. and code yeah. quality they used uh, sonar cube and jmeter mm -hmm. you, you know about the sonar cube right yes yeah, sonar cube is okay sonar static cube for, code yeah static code analysis and many other code analysis stuff you know many other code analysis. the great even the uh, security analysis mm -hmm. and yes. the security compliance and everything so you can yeah, plug in any any uh, security or even yeah. testing uh, plug in inside it any component inside it and jmeter yes. for the load testing since it was a java application and so since the work from the java can jmeter yeah, yeah. jmeter okay testing and resilience you know uh, the heavy traffic right so they achieved uh, they went to a big step so that actually yeah. started the real uh, start starting point for the devops hmm? devops so, so for devops adoption was okay they they started uh, uh, with the agile methodologies right so even for the operations they became agile yeah so they they mm -hmm. got agility and quality and reliability for the delivery side or the operation side delivery and even operation side hmm? yeah. and they they were able to actually focus on the continuous improvement because there was they started getting some feedback hmm? so team agility mm -hmm. the team started working you know uh, without having a lot of uh, operational headaches now team agility they wanted they, they were able to focus on their main goals which was actually to develop the features for the customers yeah so mm -hmm. this was a very good solid foundation for the future enhancements yeah so how yeah. how this helped many books mm -hmm. it actually helped many books to fast grow faster fast growth you know mm -hmm. so it becoming a you know healthcare uh, technology provider in the industry a prominent one so they they started getting more visibility into more clients because of the faster growth and the reliability and it started serving mm -hmm. the need and was able to release the few features very frequently and then more customers and then of course the this whole devops thing allowed arjun to hire more people into the, his dev team so okay. it had pension without headaches yeah okay. uh, next challenge next challenge mm -hmm. it was basically the architecture limitation so look at the current mm -hmm. architecture current architecture basically the, it has just three components right uh, one is the front end mm -hmm. one is the back end api and the uh, and the database so only three components yeah. in high level architecture mm -hmm. of course there could be you know now more components like a, a load balancers load balancers yeah. And network, uh, network configurations and everything. Yeah, uh, so the, the let's consider the, the let's keep it outside, considering that that is for part of infrastructure. Now the application level, three components. Mm -hmm. But if you yeah. look at the components, can you read the? Uh, are you able to read the uh, elements inside it, like appointment scheduling, um, 
patient management electronic uh, health records etc are you able to see in the screen yes yes yes, yes. Right. In the the java problems. spring boot yes. yeah you can read you can read java spring boot mm -hmm. yeah. below that you can see the uh, features business features yes. so this company now has appointment scheduling patient management uh, electronic health mm -hmm. record, many many uh, features now everything is in one single application uh, application this is okay. called a, so this is a monolithic application now although mm -hmm. the front is separate but still a monolithic front end and a monolithic back end and a monolithic database okay. everything is monolithic there, there are many problems here because uh, now for every small feature he has to build and deploy the end their thing so that means there is a downtime mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the problem is like uh, whenever something goes wrong in one small feature or a module it may affect the whole application mm -hmm. yeah uh, and yes. it is very hard to maintain because whenever we change a code, a simple, a simple place, you know, it might have a lot of dependency with each other. So it may mm -hmm. slow down. Yeah, it may slow down the building, development, deployment, and everything. So this is a typical scenario of a growing monolith, a monolithic mm -hmm. beast. Yeah. So this is a scaling, mm -hmm. scaling challenge, like a functionally scaling challenges. Even scaling challenges, like for example, uh, suppose uh, there are certain modules where free people are using frequently very frequently so that module cannot be boosted up cannot be scaled up inde independently because everything yeah. is single piece once a large piece right so that is the scaling yes. challenge yeah yeah now they want they they didn't have a the right guy to actually take decisions architectural decisions so they were they decided to hire a solutions architect mm -hmm. uh, mr ayan kapoor uh, joined the uh, joined as a solution architect and uh, his mission was to architectural transformation. He want, he he should uh, transform the entire application, entire system architecturally, yeah, which should enable faster development and which should fix the uh, scaling issues and achieve zero downtime because of the monolithic nature of the system. Every release means there is a downtime, there is a testing time, there is a you know uh, uh, whenever something goes wrong, that again causes more downtime, more disruptions, more uh, you know you know errors, more problem. Yeah, more customer satisfaction issues. Yeah, so he demanded a better architecture to avoid all these negative things and then uh, go go to the future. So they wanted to foster a quality development and predictable develop delivery of the modules without affecting any other module. So they wanted a better architecture. Okay. So what Mr. Ayan Kapoor or the uh, solution architect did was he proposed a monolith, uh, microservices architecture he proposed mm -hmm. to break down the big monolithic giant into smaller pieces mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. now previously in the previous screen this screen you are seeing these uh, features right appointment scheduling question management yeah. and everything inside one simple application right now these yes. features these features became separate applications yes. separate services these are microservices on the back end api module okay. like Appointment schedule is a, a microservice API, you know. Patient management mm -hmm. is another API. Yeah. yeah. They are directly dependent. They have uh, indirect passive dependency. So they yes. distributed the whole monolith and adopted the microservice architecture. Mm -hmm. So now what are mm -hmm. the benefits of this? Now they can develop or improve one module at a time without affecting the others. So yes. they can achieve independent deployment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they can scale. Uh, a certain applications which which requires more scalability, more number of users, they can scale it, they can boost it, they can boost or yeah. give more, more. They can beef up the server or beef up the. Uh, we are not yet with container. Beef up the VM or the uh, EC2 machine or that service with more RAM or more number of instances. Mm -hmm. So that was a yes. benefit. And they can develop modularly. So one of the biggest benefits in the architecture perspective is that each independent module is very simple now. Yes. Architecture is complex. Architecture yes. became complex. The previous one, architecture yes. was very simple, right? But the yes. application module development became complex as, as it grew. Now, each yes. application is very simple. Look at the internals of each application. They are very simple, very easy to understand, very easy to develop, very easy to enhance yes. the features. And even for yeah. deployment and everything, the, so now features the are independent. Mm -hmm. Features are independent, right? Correct. 
so the architecture taken all the complexity into its so its own shoulder yeah okay. applications <laughs> simple that's the biggest benefit yeah hmm? and even yes. they did the front end and they modularized the front end applications you know simple applications and they uh, if you know about something called uh, uh, micro front ends micro front end uh -huh. is micro services equivalent on the front end previously you know initially yeah. micro services were was only on the back end they divided yes. the, their back end into the smaller services deployed independently and but the front end was one single beast now we have uh, the front end also evolved we have the ability to divide uh, the front end also into smaller pieces and combine them yes. and give a combined a unified view without the customer noticing that they are different individual pieces yeah so yes. that that yes. architecture is called micro front end architecture so on the front end and back end it, it is now um, microservices and you can see one mm -hmm. new guy in the middle who is called uh, api gateway so yeah. api gateway is a component that actually unifies all the requests into one single channel yeah. so that you know the yeah. front ends, uh, so it's a single entry point for the front end clients exactly exactly so the front end okay. guys front end applications doesn't need to struggle with uh, you finding out they don't need to maintain different a uh, lot of changing uh, urls or endpoints so they have one single entry point yeah. right all right okay now so the microservices has a lot of operational issues how will we deploy and connect each other yeah because it has a problem of you know uh, if you scale up uh, one particular service if you have three instances mm -hmm. which one should i call how do i know that okay which particular instance i should connect with okay. yeah. all mm -hmm. this okay, so that and uh, deploying independent ones and you know adding them into the cluster is a big problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes for that, for that they actually and uh, another thing okay i just wanted to mention one benefit of this microservice architecture is that uh, I, I didn't okay. write down this uh, powerpoint presentation which is actually polyglot mm -hmm. you can become polyglot okay polyglot means mm -hmm. like uh, it was in java right so you can hire you yeah. know yeah, people from other background and maybe you know yeah, okay. you can develop one module in go lang go language another one yes, in go language yeah, another one in python mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everyone, mm -hmm. everything can work together because they are yeah. all. So it allows teams to leverage the tools, right? Uh, it's like uh, the polyglot front end is we can choose uh, which lang programming languages, frameworks uh, by each front end Microsoft. Like it's exactly. based on its recommend. Exactly, exactly. Based on many, many factors. Okay. So it's not just limited to front end, even, even on the back end, even on front end or back end, okay. even the database. Even the database. Okay. The database doesn't okay. need to be a SQL based or relation, relational database all the time. It can be no SQL okay. database. You can you can choose mm -hmm. uh, depending on the, okay. your requirement, your the nature of the data, nature of the application, okay. Okay. and even the availability of the people. So okay. all guys are very expensive, but uh, there are mm -hmm. cheaper Node.js guys are available on the side. So why don't we hire mm -hmm. Node.js developer for that? And not just there are better frameworks, for example, easy, faster okay. development, mm -hmm. or even uh, .NET, yeah, e okay. even uh, uh, Python. There are many Python developers out there, jobless, but uh, why don't we leverage them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that is everything is possible. But the challenge over here is that okay, for each of these technology stack and application, they have different dependencies. I see. They have a lot of different dependencies. Different. They are using different frameworks different technologies yeah, different yeah. configurations so that's a big operational challenge and if i have multiple instances of this and uh, i have many developers for working and sitting on different machines different chairs different different areas different locations how do i distribute all these com complexities in a scalable or a sustainable way for that mm -hmm. i need a better packaging mechanism yes. that is containerization right so yeah, yeah. I, I hope you already know the high-level concept of containerization. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So you can contain all the complexities, yeah. all the mm -hmm. internal elements into a container, into a space, mm -hmm. into a yeah. space, and you can just write down in a file in a declarative mm -hmm. fashion, and you just need to uh, start up. Mm -hmm. And if it works yeah. for your machine, you can give it to yeah. the, the next your fellow members. And it will definitely work mm -hmm. on their machines. Mm -hmm. okay. 
so they achieved that one so so yeah. this operational problem to an extent operational complexities of maintaining smaller services and their managing their dependencies their configurations so they packaged everything using containers mm -hmm. so <laughs> now if you look at uh, look at this like everything including the front end back end services api gateway everything is in container now we can potentially yeah. use database also put the database also inside the containers but the best practice is like uh, use the cloud enabled or the cloud powered uh, cloud managed databases like rds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so some people actually go with a mix, a hybrid solution. Like some of the databases are inside uh, uh, RDS, RDS or the cloud provided cloud managed databases. Some of them are in still Docker containers, and the data file is in three or EFS, uh, like a, a cloud managed uh, storage solution. So we have mm -hmm. a lot of choice now. So yeah. in architect designs, okay, this is the structure of my application. And this is uh, each application is defined in a Docker file, mm -hmm. and defined all different dependencies. Mm -hmm. Everything is contained, and everything connects and work together on my machine as a POC proof of concept. Then I can easily distribute it to any developer or any member in my team, mm -hmm. and he can also recreate the same instance, same uh, scenario, same setup on his machine. And then finally, it works on these guys' machines. Finally, I can push the same thing to the production. Okay. It will work, definitely work. So there is no yeah. uh, environment parity problem. All mm -hmm. environments okay. are getting closer, getting equal, same. Mm -hmm. yes. So I can. Uh, uh, so this gives me consistency across environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes. for a typical development team, there would be a developer's machine. There will be a continuous integration server. There would be one or more testing servers, mm -hmm. including the staging server and a UAT server or whatever. And finally, the production server. Mm -hmm. All these servers, mm -hmm. in the traditional scenario, the configurations and everything was different. Now, there is no difference except the capacity, the RAM or you know the processing power. Rest everything, the full setup, everything can be same because everything was returned, everything is now returned in a Docker file. So mm -hmm. it's also a problem of, okay, uh, previous blame games like, okay, it works on my machine. I don't know why it's not working on your machine. It's your problem. That's over. Mm -hmm. So the problem of, okay, yeah, it works on my machine. If it works on my machine, it will work anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So reduce the environment discrepancies. And now I have more or better ways to improve the scalability. Yeah. Okay. So, Microservices and containerization work hand in hand. And containerization is an enabler of microservices and it solves many of the complexities, many of the operational issues of containerization. Now we have another problem. Inside, if we have just containerization, there is no efficient way to connect them together, connect the services together. Even the managing, mm -hmm. even managing the scalability, yeah, even managing the number of instances. So mm -hmm. You have worked with uh, Docker. Have you worked with Docker, or do you, are you aware of? Uh, I have worked with Docker, uh, but uh, I'm new to this Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, have you tried uh, Docker Compose? Uh, Docker Compose. Yes, I know Docker Compose. Okay. So you can have you know multiple instances of the same thing inside uh, Docker Compose. Mm. Mm -hmm. Let's say this architecture. This architecture you can easily recreate using a Docker Compose. You can mm -hmm. you can have all your front-end applications, back-end applications, uh, uh, your databases, your API gateway, and everything. You can com containerize everything inside Docker Compose, and you can make it together. Uh, and you just say uh, Docker Compose up. Your end layer system is up and running and connected to each other, and you can start using it. But there is a problem for that. Uh, it cannot. It it has to run inside only one VM. You cannot leverage mm -hmm. multiple. VMs. So if you are running it in a VM. And if that VM crashes, everything is gone. OK. Mm -hmm. So that's where the relevance of uh, Kubernetes and orchestra orchestration engine is required. The mm -hmm. primary source is the uh, scalability of the underlying virtual machines, underlying uh, even the hard, uh, the local machines. So you can okay. 
uh, one or two or ten or whatever number of uh, virtual machines or even the physical servers, you can mm -hmm. cluster them together and mm -hmm. build a Kubernetes cluster on top of that. You can create a Kubernetes okay. layer on top of that, and you deploy your Docker containers into that cluster, into that layer of okay. And then you configure, you tell Kubernetes that, OK, uh, mm -hmm. this is my service, and I need minimum three instances and maximum three instances, depending on the load. And this is the threat. You can configure everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my service name. And you can tell the other applications, OK, this is the service name of that service. You just need to call it, you'll get it. OK. All right. OK, so uh, it relieves a lot of configuration issues from the for, for the developers. Otherwise, the developers has to remember so many IP addresses, mm -hmm. so uh, service names, and which instance, and uh, they have to configure a lot of stuff. Now, that headache is actually taken by Kubernetes. We need to tell Kubernetes mm -hmm. once, and then we keep deploying the application, and it will cover everything. And uh, we start with the three virtual machines, for example, and mm -hmm. uh, build a Kubernetes cluster. And we realized that, OK, uh, now the uh, number of views or the load is increasing. So I need to add more. You can configure that at the uh, cloud level. This case, okay. yeah, for the elastic scalability or the scaling group mm -hmm. at AWS, for example. You can mm -hmm. okay, if the load of the Kubernetes service goes beyond, uh, let's say, 70%, add one more uh, instance into the cloud. So okay. now leverage and club the power of cloud and containerization and microservices and the application together in one platform mm -hmm. uh, kubernetes kubernetes okay. on top of the cloud based uh, cluster cloud vm cluster kubernetes creates another layer that allows the application developers easily without worrying about the configurations they can just push the deployment mm -hmm. okay so, Kubernetes becomes the orchestrator of the requests, of the services, everything, mm -hmm. of the containerized services, uh, without mm -hmm. the developers to worry about how to connect and how to configure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it, it so uh, Kubernetes, a, like a build and a resource availability, it will automatically schedule and, and uh, distribute the container, right? Exactly, exactly. And it, it okay. has so many other uh, uh, abilities, like for, for example, uh, there are many cases, you know, Let's say we have 10 virtual machines inside mm -hmm. this virtual machine, uh, and my application has five instances. Okay. My okay. service has five instances. I can tell tell Kubernetes that, okay, you know, uh, distribute evenly. Mm -hmm. So the first instance should go to your VM1, second one go to VM2, third one, so that, you know, mm -hmm. even if one server crashes, the service okay. is available. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. The crash also it manages automatically. It detects okay this this instance is not available, so the router should automatically route to the available instances. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So, so the one crash of one server or two servers it will not affect the whole application. So the high availability is still achieved. Mm -hmm. okay. There are scenarios where because of the security reasons or whatever some uh, organizational compliance or policy requirements. Mm -hmm. We can schedule that case. This kind of application, let's say accounts related, finance related services should go only to this one, two, three VMs or EC2 instances. Okay. Because there are certain uh, extra security layers inside that that protects my financial data. Mm -hmm. All these things can be configured at Kubernetes. So there are the strategies that allows us to um, Deploy or you know uh, distribute the deployment uh, based on our business requirements in Kubernetes. Okay. So Kubernetes, we can okay. we can automate everything and we can declaratively tell everything. So we don't need to program much. There is no big programming. It's all declarative okay. um, you know, coding. It's it's basically okay. we write everything in the code, but it's declarative, not program. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. and since uh, for Arjun for the MIDI books, since it was on. Mm -hmm. uh, AWS, they started using mm -hmm. on Elastic Kubernetes Services, EKS, for the production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for the development, uh, probably they might have used uh, uh, locally set up uh, Elastic 
the Kubernetes cluster. Purely set upon, um, let's say, VMware cluster, VMware uh, virtualization layer. Mm -hmm. And for the production, EKS. Many people in yeah. uh, one of my <coughs> previous clients, their mm -hmm. develop, development version was, you know, yeah, inside development was in a uh, digital ocean, Kubernetes cluster. Mm -hmm. And production, it was Google Cloud. Okay. Google Cloud was slightly um, uh, exp more expensive than to, uh, digital digital ocean yeah uh, but uh, google cloud is more reliable there and it had uh, more services uh, for example yes. were mongodb so mongodb at plus more powerful on uh, google cloud so there were yeah. So, we, yeah. so kubernetes became an abstraction layer that actually abstracts mm -hmm. the underlying architecture underlying cloud provider from us mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and allowing us to focus on our business development, business uh, development for the business features. Okay, yes. so that's the story. So they adopted Docker and Kubernetes uh, to support the microservice architecture. And now that that story is over. That level, that okay. level is done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now the problem is that uh, yeah, the previous CI/CD was not for containerization; it was for simple deployment. It was just okay. SCD. now. For the Kubernetes, they needed a special uh, deployment because you know the one of the biggest challenge on mm -hmm. containerized deployment is that um, the previous one was like okay, you have a build, uh, you have Git checkout, mm -hmm. then build the application, then maybe yes. probably run all your tests, uh, unit tests, and then yes. then package, and then deploy. Mm -hmm. That is the only yes. thing. Now we have one yeah. for the after building the application. After mm -hmm. the after building the application, you have to build a mm -hmm. container. You can you have to package it in the container. Okay. And you need to put in a container registry like a Docker Hub. Docker Hub, yes. Docker Hub. Many people don't prefer to use Docker Hub. So the mm -hmm. cloud providers they provide a lot of uh, their own solutions. Let's say. ECR, Elastic Container Registry, is the container registry inside uh, AWS. ECR, okay. ECR, okay. Elastic Container Registry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we, we need to push. So first, we need to uh, check out, build, package into the application, let's say a uh, Spring Boot application, and package it into a Docker container. That Docker okay. container to push into the ECR. Our, we have our own account, our own you know uh, namespaces. Inside our mm -hmm. name, we push into ECR. It goes to that uh, container registry, and okay. the pipeline goes on. Pipeline goes to the other side. Now he's trying to deploy. So he pulls the specific version of the image, the container image. Mm -hmm. Push the specific yeah. version because this particular uh, service, let's say uh, appointment booking, every week mm -hmm. there is so version one, two, three, four, five, six, mm -hmm. and maybe yeah. some. One one particular version is 1.2, 1.3, like patch releases mm, for a particular, mm -hmm. for example, mm, or some bug fix okay. release. Mm -hmm. So the specific release, we need to go and pull on the other side. After pushing into the side, this uh, container registry, mm, we mm -hmm. need to the production server. We need to, mm -hmm. uh, we need to, on the production server, we have a cluster, right? Inside that cluster, yes. I have to specify. Mm -hmm. For the so I have a set of files for Kubernetes. Inside okay. the Kubernetes, I specify this is my service. So I need to define my inventory. Let's say this is my set of services. My booking mm -hmm. service for this particular release, this is 2.2 .2 or 2.3. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So based on that version number, it knows which container registry. And okay. based on the service uh, name. I have I know which particular image, which particular mm -hmm. container, which version, mm -hmm. and then make it up and running. Okay. Mm -hmm. So manually doing all these things are very error prone. Cumbersome. Yes. Yeah. It can fail sometimes. We miss so many things and it will take a lot of time. Even if we have a yeah. very written uh, checklist, but still yes. potentially we can make a lot of mistakes and it takes time. Yes. That means there yes. is a downtime. So we need to automate it. So yes, yes. this guy's now uh, the, the DevOps engineer. 
and uh, architects, both of them work together to actually build all these previous guys, like um, uh, the microservices architecture. They did the, mm -hmm. they containerized the microservices. Then they uh, adopted the orchestration uh, Kubernetes. Yeah, those they defined all the complex complex configurations and the scaling and everything. Now they wanted to incorporate all this whole story into the pipeline. Yes. So they redefined the pipeline. They rebuilt it for containers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the container now leverages so many things. There, there are other smaller stories like help charge and everything. So I'm skipping all this. Things. So I'm putting. I'm not putting everything inside it. But a high level idea. Okay. You, I want you to get. Okay. The story, yeah? yes. So yes. the pipeline is pushing or talking to the container registry. Previously, it was just one source. It had just one source. Yes. The only source was Git Git repository or the GitHub or the yes. internal yes. repository. We, we can potentially yes. yeah, set up our own internal Git, Git repository. Like we can uh, set up our own Git lab, for example. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so depending on that, and uh, depending on the organization, previously my only source was the GitHub or maybe the Git repository. Now I have one more thing for the container registry. So the pipeline is okay. still all, all these things. So container is pushing to the container registry first. And from the production, mm -hmm. and pulling with the help of okay. files. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the pipeline is not pulling actually. It is actually the Kubernetes okay. engine, Kubernetes okay. API server or whatever. Kubernetes uh, server or the cluster is pulling the specific version of that uh, container service, container container okay. image, then starting it up and you know uh, starting the specific number of uh, instances. Let's say initial number is three, so there are three instances. Mm -hmm. And they registered with the, all the other configurations, like okay, registered as a service, made it available, and secured it with the, all the uh, access controls and everything. And now everything is ready. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now they they can potentially apply uh, no downtime or zero downtime deployment strategies, mm -hmm. like a blue green, okay. blue green, blue green yes. canary, mm -hmm. canary deployments and everything. So mm -hmm. it uh, minimized or maybe reduced, you know, downtime and the uh, risk mm -hmm. of uh, new releases. Let's say while uh, while you are releasing a specific version, uh, something yeah. better, you can immediately roll back by changing the version name. So you know yes. you can even configure everything. You know, so if something goes wrong, instead of two dot three, roll back to mm -hmm. two dot. Yeah. Two two was stable. Two dot two three yeah. is any. It it has something mm -hmm. went wrong, so it captured everything, but it rolled back immediately. So it's a matter of just flipping from the new one to the old one. So it is still live. So the service okay. is available. There is no downtime. And mm -hmm. combining this with the blue green uh, strategy, the mm -hmm. benefit is that, okay. So the let's say the green is on the front available. Yeah. We have the, the mm -hmm. blue. Yeah. And uh, if the blue failed, yeah, we, we do not turn it into green. Mm -hmm. still, the blue is so green is still the old one. So the okay. service is uh, consistently available uh, for the customers. There is no downtime. So we can apply all okay. these things. So green will be idle. Sorry? Green is idle or the blue is active, right? Yeah, we have two different Actually, by default, I, I think green is the uh, active one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Even we can actually uh, specify uh, for some IP addresses, we can access blue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. It's accessible for some particular set of people. So the Green. new releases are deployed into the idle environment or active environment? Uh, this is active. The... Can you come again? Uh, I missed your question. Actually, the new releases, actually, there will be two identical production environments. One is blue and green, as you said. So the new releases are deployed into the idle environment or active environment. So uh, which is then switched to active environment or are, not? Yes, there are multiple options. One option is that everything is in one uh, one single production environment. We mark mm -hmm. some of the blue and some of them as green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why green is available for everyone. Blue is available only from certain IP addresses. OK. Mm -hmm. That is possible. Mm -hmm. In some okay. cases, okay, say blue goes to these virtual machines, green goes okay. to this machine. Or even in a mm -hmm. Kubernetes environment, some of them are like, okay, um, 
uh, you know, namespaces. Some blue mm -hmm. go to this namespace, green goes to that namespace. So there is an isolation. Okay. Green is available mm -hmm. for public. Blue is available for mm -hmm. the operation team, or maybe you know our sanity check team, or maybe one particular client. Mm -hmm. We can configure for, for all, all these strategies. Okay. So, uh, when we are fully confident, we can we, we can actually push it to green. Uh, I actually okay. put is the active one by default, but uh, I suppose we we can configure any of them. So okay. the goal. Okay. The idea is that uh, we don't need to make the uh, unstable versions public. We can mm -hmm. test them on the production, and we can give you know access to certain set of users, safe users, safe companies, or maybe safe clients. You know, okay. uh, to run the to test their set of features. And mm -hmm. if it's wrong, we can flip. We can actually roll back, and you know, go go, go back to a previous version. That's the idea. Okay. So all this is possible now because of the containerization. Uh, mm -hmm. And orchestration and CI/CD for containerization. We can mm -hmm. apply these strategies. Yeah, all these things are achievable now. Medibooks is in a very good uh, you know, shape, so it got consistency mm -hmm. across environments. Dev test proud. Yeah, there is no yeah, difference. Everything is in at par. There is a parity. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, it works for me. Days are over. It works everywhere. Like it works on test server. But on production, there are surprises. Previously, there's a common scenario in my experience of you know more than 20 years in IT. Uh, most of the features will work on developer machine, yeah, and uh, there will be very little problem on a test server. And now we fix everything on yeah. test server. When it goes to production, we'll see new problems. There are surprises. That is very yes. amber. Yeah. So that's that's a common scenario. That is now uh, yeah. uh, over because of this structure, containerization, mm -hmm. effective utilization. Yeah. Container session will save us from that thing. But definitely, yes. there will be uh, many cases related to data that also we have to take care of. Hmm? So, one yes. of the things which I didn't specify here is like, okay, well, how, how do we deploy the data? That is a detail of it. Yes. So, I'm not going to uh, spend time much now. Okay. Yes. Data deployment automation is also required. Okay. So, that, mm -hmm. that's one missing piece. Yeah. Now, and uh, the there is a streamlined uh, deployment pipeline, more reliable service rollouts. Rollouts, we can roll out any feature very reliably, predictably. Yeah, and polyglot development, freedom of tech, tech stack choice, pro any programming language, any framework which is suitable for our uh, requirement mm -hmm. and our our convenience. Mm -hmm. You know, and scalability and flexibility. Yeah, I can manage services and loads, service loads. Uh, if there are some certain uh, modules. Which takes more uh, traffic, then I can beef up mm -hmm. only that part without uh, uh, affecting the whole thing, or maybe you know with at reduced cost. So it gives me a cost savings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, operational excellence with uh, Kubernetes, focus on innovation. I can now you know uh, roll out no very, a lot of new features very easily. Yeah. So it gives me a lot of. Fun. And product uh, developer productivity is very high now because. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything is in Docker file, right? So all my dependencies, everything is written, pre-written in my um, Docker, 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 Docker file. Mm -hmm. So previously yes. that was you. Uh, anytime a new developer comes in into a particular team, then the, he'll take mm -hmm. to the set up his environment. Now there is no such thing. So you just mm -hmm. uh, install Docker and you check yes. out from this uh, Git repository, run uh, the Docker compose up or maybe you know Minikube up, yeah. So mm -hmm. the mini cube on and everything. So everything, all your development environment is ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now there is there is no you know uh, ramp up time for the developer. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, all the new frameworks is first declared declared in a uh, Docker file. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now there is there is a very good streamlined process for the development, and even mm -hmm. even even the deployment. So everything and pass. So whatever you do on development. It's the same thing on the uh, uh, operation side or the delivery side. Yeah, so mm -hmm. very easy. Everything is very, very much visible now. Okay. Yeah. And um, now, security, uh, you can configure uh, all your security in one place, which is container. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can configure everything uh, at container level. And if, yes. if there are many places you can say, uh, apply your security. One is container, the other one is for your pipeline. And even at the cloud, the C2 level, now you have uh, Kubernetes. You're using the Kubernetes, you can create your own security net networks. 
you can create yeah. your security networks in Kubernetes. So many layers of security is possible now. Mm -hmm. And a future-ready infrastructure for a sustainable and competitive edge. Yeah, so all these things will help the business to focus on yes. more customers and more money. Yeah. So yeah. a perfect example of how technology allows and helps leverages mm -hmm. leverages the power of technology and everything. How it helps to uh, grow the business. Mm -hmm. So the, the, that's a, that's the a story so far. Okay. Now there is yeah. new, new challenges again. Yeah. Our challenges are not now. Uh, although we automated so many things, even pipeline, we automated the pipeline and everything. The infrastructure is yes. managed. Yes. We configure the uh, EC2 instances. We configure the network. We configure the security. IAM and everything is manual now. We need that uh, brings up a lot of uh, issues in uh, healthcare. Since Arjun's the this company, Medic Books has grown into a bigger conglomerate, bigger uh, uh, healthcare solution. Uh, mm -hmm. many, uh, large healthcare providers started using their system, but they don't want to put their application into uh, a shared server. They don't want to. Mm -hmm. they, they 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 have very confidential data. They want them to keep okay. their data to their own um, Amazon accounts or even uh, in house. You know, in house okay. and. and so there are requirements to actually separate them. So this okay. requirement is set up in, you know, so since the environment setup, everything is manual, it is very hard mm -hmm. to actually go and configure and everything, configure and set up and deploy everything in different environments. It's uh, error prone and they usually end up in uh, wasting a lot of uh, manual efforts. Yeah. And it's not just mm -hmm. one uh, environment, right? So some of the clients, they wanted all their test and production environment in their own environments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so this replication of the environment was a big, big problem. And in some of the clients, uh, depending on their region, like uh, in Europe, the security requirements were different. In the US, it's different. Australia, it's different. Yeah. In the Far East, it's different. Mm -hmm. So yes. they wanted to actually apply many of these uh, security standards at the infrastructure level differently. Mm -hmm. yes. So these are some of the scenarios were they have to replicate their own different infrastructures, but at the same time, we are deploying the same application slightly mm -hmm. in a slightly different way. Yeah. And uh, some of the people, they wanted the extra um, disaster recovery policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they wanted, you know, uh, some people, they wanted hourly backup, uh, daily backup, and, you know, uh, uh, recovery within very minimal time. Like uh, within within minutes, within hours, within uh, you know. So there, there are so many such requirements. They wanted to actually configure, and uh, they have teams. They have external consultancies and agencies to audit all these compliances, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they need access. So yeah. we cannot share the shared server credentials and okay. everything. Allow anyone to access that shared server because it contains so many people's data, so many companies' data. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be separated. So okay. all these things, doing all these things manually is very cumbersome and it is very, you know, unmanageable, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where infrastructure as code comes into the play. Okay. So they decided, okay, now we need to replicate everything, right? So we need an easy yes. mechanism. We need an easy mechanism to, okay, we have an environment. We convert it into a code and it just apply it once and it applies, it go creates the whole in infrastructure in one account. Mm -hmm. And I take the same set of files, same set of uh, code, and go to another account. And if I run there, it, it should create the whole infrastructure there in the same way. Yes. And if I have differences, changes, I just need to mm -hmm. change one or two places. And then I apply it again. So it is, okay. it is applied there. So yeah, you very, very easily with that difference. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. The, and another thing is that okay, uh, today my uh, infrastructure, infrastructure is like this. Tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, one year or maybe after six months, I have some changes. Mm -hmm. I have introduced, me, let's say, a machine learning related uh, many components. Let's say I okay. have introduced some LLMs, large learning models, yes. language learning models. Mm -hmm. I wanted mm -hmm. to bring up something like an, an in house chat GPT kind of uh, uh, mechanism, mm -hmm. a service. Mm -hmm. 
so that the I, the patients can go ask any question even mm -hmm. uh, implementing with the voice uh voice to text functionality so they just need to ask okay, okay i have a cough uh, i have a very mm -hmm. severe throat, throat pain and so what should i do mm -hmm. so the system should be able to uh, and uh, i want to consult a doctor uh, this is these are my systems automatically it can go book the right doctor let's say okay. such, a, such a system for someone so that and any day uh, you know any time any such new requirements come in my infrastructure may change because I'm picking up a new service from Amazon. Hmm? Yes. For the uh, for the, let's say big data uh, solution, a mm -hmm. AI based uh, service, and uh, mm -hmm. such a separate storage, a separate mm -hmm. uh, voice to voice to um, text solution. Any any such thing. Let's say even tomorrow, I want to actually interchange the electronic uh, medical records using blockchain. I want to okay. leverage blockchain. So my infrastructure mm -hmm. is changing, right? So if I do not have a very well documented and maintained infrastructural mm -hmm. uh, architectural place, a mechanism, okay. then I may potentially go and make a lot of mistakes. Yes. And I have multiple environments like that, multiple environments. Like let's say I have uh, out of my 100 customers, 10 customers mm -hmm. that have their own VPCs, virtual private clouds. Okay. Or they have mm -hmm. the um, uh, uh, you know separate uh, hybrid clouds. Some of them mm -hmm. that are their on-premise uh, data center. Let's say. Yes. So in such scenarios, how will I apply this new feature, roll out all this new feature predictably? For that, I need mm -hmm. a service code. I need a mechanism yes. where I can code the infrastructure declaratively. Hmm? Yes. Go apply. Just apply, and it will go create it. Or you know update yes. update my infrastructure. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's a scenario of infrastructure com coming in, uh, infrastructure as code coming in. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. tools Terraform as you have already used, uh, Ansible and Amazon Cloud Formation. Yeah, and many other things like for uh, Azure, it's um, ARM, uh, Azure Resource Manager, Google Deployment Manager. So for each mm -hmm. infrastructure, each cloud platform, it's different, but the concept is same. Infrastructure score. Yeah. Now Terraform. You this this slide might be this code snippet might be familiar for you, right? Yes, yes. If you have used it, yeah. So you declare yes, exactly. who's the provider, yeah. what's the resource, what are the configurations? Yeah. Yes. And what yes. is the network? What is the security? And everything you configure, yes. just go say apply. It will yes. go create everything for you. Yes. Okay, so this is about uh, Terraform. Now Ansible. Yes. Ansible and Terraform actually can do both the same things, but uh, the, the yes. uses are slightly different here and there. Hmm? Yes. Many places, and uh, Terraform is being used for uh, provisioning your uh, in infrastructure. Let's say provisioning your EC2 instances, provisioning uh, uh, your RDS, your S3, and uh, many many such things. And on top of that, use Ansible to go deploy and configure many things like uh, Kubernetes. It's mm -hmm. it is uh, Ansible's job. Although uh, Terraform also can do it, but with Ansible you have more control. You can program. You can write a playbook. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, uh, more than you, you, you have declarative as programmatic facilities inside Ansible, and you can go yes, a little yes. bit deeper using Ansible. You can do yes, a lot of yes. configurations with Ansible. Yes. Yes. And even deployment and everything. So most of the people, most of the you know, DevOps team, they use both of them in coordination, in harmony. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it can go do so many things on top of mm -hmm. the provision already provisioned by uh, Terraform. Okay. okay. Now cloud formation, you have more control, but only on AWS. Mm -hmm. You can have easy access to the services. You can easily uh, define, declare, and you know configure everything. So another infrastructure as code tool only for AWS. And the other okay. two are holistic. They work anywhere for any any provider. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, orchestrating with the Amazon uh, cloud formation. So you, you can so suppose if you are using uh, Amazon uh, AWS, then you have uh, EC. Um, 
what is that? Uh, EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service. You have to use, uh, Kuber sorry, uh, cloud formation for mm -hmm. changing, you know, frequently changing, or so it is up to date with the uh, AWS related releases. Yes. And Comlwins, Terraforms, infrastructure orchest orchestration. So you still you use both. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Still you use both. If you are just using yes. uh, uh, AWS, you can potentially use uh, cloud, cloud formation alone. Okay. okay. Use, uh, all of these things together, you know, and then mm -hmm. there's uh, where to use uh, Terraform, when to use uh, cloud formation, and uh, what uh, extra configurations uh you use for uh, use use with uh, ansible mm -hmm. so you have a plethora of uh, tools to use in combination to achieve your infrastructure as code uh, requirements okay. mm -hmm. now previously it was a bottleneck right now everything is predictable now everything is uh, you know even another another biggest benefit is that version control mm -hmm. then your infrastructure is now version controlled Okay. Yesterday, you have a, a kind of infrastructure, and today you are making a, some change. And you have mm -hmm. a set of files which is already in version control, already in GitHub, already in your repository. Yes. And the yes. version yes. number is different. And you can apply this version number at the infrastructure level. And anytime you want to go back to the version, yes, previous version. So you don't need to upgrade all your different, different uh, set of infrastructures in, at the same day. So mm -hmm. you have a new feature, as we discussed earlier, uh, utilizing yeah. the power of LLM to book the appointment. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, yes. You need to vocally say that, OK, I have this problem. Give me an appointment at the specific, any suitable doctor. That feature, mm -hmm. you are rolling out on customer. Okay. You apply that with a specific version of the infrastructure. And once mm -hmm. it is stable for that customer, you can roll out into the other customers uh, with, the, with the same number but in a different day different dates okay okay so that is another big benefit so your infrastructure is version controlled that's the biggest difference well that's one of the big difference okay yes. and you have operational efficiency everything is predictable and no yes. there is no manual errors mm -hmm. yes. and you can configure so suppose if you want to increase your, uh, your threshold of your scalability let's say now there's a lot of users instead of 10 to the maximum limit, I want to make it to 15. You go modify mm -hmm. file and uh, apply in the new version and apply it, and it will go and uh, adjust it automatically. There's no manual error. Yes. Everything is perfect. Yes. So if you want to see your infrastructure, go and look at the infrastructure mm -hmm. code, your code. Everything is in your code. Mm -hmm. And there are visualization tools to visualize your uh, production uh, environment Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. on your desktop. So these are the advantages. Mm -hmm. So okay. you, you have a vision about your uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and yeah. you, the, you, you utilizing the technology, uh, the IAC, you are applying it. And and yes. the reverse yes. version as well. So this is your infrastructure. How will I visualize okay. it? Use IAC, define in IAC. Mm -hmm. So you have that visualization. And so it okay. will allow the evolution or the growth of your infrastructure mm -hmm. seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Now the next challenge is multi-cloud. <laughs> so they okay. want to the services from uh, Google. Yeah, this okay. service, let's say it's not very efficient, or you know, yeah, it's not even available in uh, Google. Uh, sorry, uh, AWS okay. or uh, uh, Amazon. So you you have this service available in Google, or maybe Google is coming up from offer. For this service, we will give you mm -hmm. this one. We will give you a lot of uh, discounts. Yeah, so okay. they. Post so this is that, that is one of the benefits. Like you can you, with multi cloud, you can pick and choose one of the most cost efficient services in which uh, cloud platform, which provider, mm -hmm. and you can connect them each other as if everything okay. is on, on your premise. Everything mm -hmm. is in your network. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, this is a bigger bigger advantage. So this happens only you grow very big. When you go very big, your infrastructure costs and your subscription fees are very high. And so you have to, you know, a lot of avenues to optimize your cost. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you can actually go uh, and evaluate the cost optimizer or, you know, your, your cost calculator. You can find out, okay, 
uh, where can you save some cost and you know get your extra resources uh, sometimes you know uh, azure came up with a lot of offers to actually post the customers from amazon but not for all services so in this scenario <laughs> You can actually select the, you can choose the specific services from Azure, specific services from Amazon, so that you can marry uh, both worlds. You know, uh, so that so embracing the multi-cloud infrastructure is one challenge. One opportunity mm -hmm. is a challenge. Okay. Uh, another one is like you know, yeah, one typical scenario was you know, um, in the Middle East, Microsoft is more trusted than Amazon mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Okay. Previously, Microsoft, mm -hmm. uh, Amazon didn't have local data centers. So they wanted okay. their, their data, government data, and many organizational data within their country, let's say UAE yes. or something. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft was actually very smart to have their own data centers first over there. So, but at mm -hmm. the same time, mm -hmm. the services are already in uh, Amazon. So this was mm -hmm. one scenario. Okay. Uh, although our application is in AWS, your data is in Azure, which is in your Abu Dhabi data center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this, this, this such scenario uh, was common in the Middle East. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, one of my one of the companies I had earlier on one of so this, this is very common, uh, mm -hmm. especially in the government and uh, telecom sectors. Mm -hmm. Okay. So scenarios, uh, this multi-cloud infrastructure uh, comes into the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, now this this is uh, so we have an option. So we, we have to adopt Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and AWS for this uh, scenario. So they adopted it. So that's a, a small part of the story. Okay. And uh, now Terraform actually helps here a lot. Since you have multi, mm -hmm. multi cloud, you cannot just use AWS, uh, AWS cloud formation. You need a holistic. <laughs> So Terraform and Ansible would help you to become uh, platform agnostic, platform neutral, mm -hmm. but achieving all the uh, infrastructural automation at, at, at once. Yeah. So IEC helped with multi-cloud uh, adoption, basically. Mm -hmm. And the benefit is like, OK, com comply, regional compliance, compliance. You comply with uh, regional rules and policies and data sovereignty laws of the company and the countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, and business continuity and reliability. Many countries, as I said, like okay, they will work only with the Microsoft things. You know? mm -hmm. So and cost savings, a lot of advantages of uh, this uh, multi-cloud adoption. Now the next challenge is like okay, now we have so many things in on production, so many infrastructural things, but we cannot see anything because we we want to see everything, you know, the health and the performance and everything uh, in one one single place, in a centralized place. So it's not just about okay. monitoring. Even we want to trace the requests. Yeah. yeah, we want to trace all the error logs and everything. So this is where the observability comes into place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So especially in the uh, healthcare, if you take as an example, they share a lot of data, mm -hmm. with many other systems, right? And uh, they okay. want to make sure that these integrations, you know, they are very mm -hmm. healthy. The services are available. And they wanted to see the traffic and everything so yeah, in one place so health is one yeah. aspect the other one is traceability mm -hmm. and yes. the uh, other one is like a user usage statistics yeah so, mm -hmm. so many parameters they wanted to see mm -hmm. yeah so the tools are like a prometheus for mm -hmm. capturing the data for capturing all the health health data performance yes. data yeah. mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. your instances your services uh, your VMs, your uh, containers, your network, yeah, and your security, security breaches, everything is captured yes. from a use. And Grafana yes. is a visualization tool, so it gives you very nice charts and graphs and everything, and put yeah. you in meaningful insights. It gives yes. you very, you know, uh, sensible insights. You can take decisions. Yeah. Yes. Decision making yes. system. Mm -hmm. So that's a combination. Yeah. Another combination is ELK stack. Yeah. Previously, it was ELK stack. Now it is Elastic stack. Previously, it was just Elastic, yeah. Elastic Search yeah. as a database, mm -hmm. log stash as the um, capturing tool or the log capturing tool. Kibana yeah. is yeah. visualization tool. Kibana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. These three guys were the combination. Now there are so many things. There is something called a Beats now. 
file bit, mm -hmm. network bit. Uh, yeah, so this is like, okay, it's not just from the files you can capture. You can capture from the network, okay. you can capture from the your database, you can capture from oh. any service. Mm -hmm. You can mm -hmm. capture even from the uh, firewalls. So, so many different okay. places you can capture. Yeah, and uh, you can put everything into Elasticsearch. You make it searchable and super performance. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And visualize it using Kibana. So using Kibana, okay. you can create your own charts and graphs. You can customize, configure your insights manually. Mm -hmm. yeah? okay. And you capture a lot of metrics, logs, and performance analytics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have a broad visibility across multiple cloud infrastructure. So let's say you have the, your whole service span across many geographical locations, multiple clouds, AWS, uh, Google Cloud, and Azure. And even, let's say, uh, this guy, even uh, digital ocean. And you want to mm -hmm. see everything in one single place. So you put all okay. these hooks, like a log stash, beats and everything, and put collect all the data inside Elasticsearch, and using Kibana, you visualize. Or even the same thing. So log stash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana, that is mainly used for the application, although it's not limited to application. It can be used even for the network, even for the um, you know system system level uh, okay. metrics. But for the system level or the network level or even the cloud level metrics, uh, people use Prometheus and Grafana. OK. Prometheus and Grafana for the infrastructure and the ELK stack or Elastic stack for application level. Even okay. you know, uh, there are many tools like, uh, I just forgot the name, like uh, Jager, things like that, uh, for mm -hmm. capturing data from your uh, APIs, from your API. Mm -hmm. So your API is like a chain of APIs. One API calls another API. It calls another service, another JMS message, like that. So, uh, so you want mm -hmm. to capture data from multiple sources, and you can chain them together. Mm -hmm. So there are many tools. Okay. Finally, you can bring everything into Elasticsearch, for example, or maybe Elastic Stack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all things are possible now. For observability, you have so many things to monitor uh, live data as well as the historical mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. cloud specific ones, AWS monitoring with CloudWatch. For the AWS, mm -hmm. for monitoring AWS resources, mm -hmm. uh, all the resources directly. Mm -hmm. So many people use even you know from CloudWatch, they take data using Prometheus and uh, um, provide a unified view uh, at the uh, at the Grafana level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, deep telemetry with the Azure Monitor, all the uh, metrics, mm -hmm. telemetry data from uh, Azure using Azure Monitor, equivalent of CloudWatch. Mm -hmm. CloudWatch, okay. And um, again, we many people combine Azure Monitor with Grafana. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you have a third view of things. Mm -hmm. And GCP, yeah, GCP observability with Operation Suite mm -hmm. with uh, for the logs, for the logs uh, for the tracing, monitoring, and reporting, trace, uh, debugging, profiling, everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not limited to. Uh, the infrastructure, even the application level, mm -hmm. even the network level, even the API level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Google has a better Google operation suite. Okay, and uh, unified observability strategy. Yeah, like uh, you have multiple clouds. You want to uh, visualize everything, all your services in one place. So you merge everything. Mm -hmm. all the uh, data you collected from different sources mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. different log called uh, Jager. Mm -hmm. uh, for cross environment tracing capabilities, tracing is basically the your uh, service in the service uh, calls at the API level or even the asynchronous calls mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. using the MQP or many many different protocols mm -hmm. collected uh, with tools like Jager and uh, display and make it uh, searchable. You can search and you can create your own uh, visualization, your own uh, charts and graphs. Mm -hmm or tables, tabular data in one single place. And on top of that, there are many features like uh, error reporting, even uh, you know notifications or uh, sending emails. Mm -hmm. Everything is possible. Mm -hmm. So just imagine Medibooks uh, operations rooms like, like this. So they have huge screens where all they can see all the uh, 
uh, services and everything you know all whatever happens within uh, all their services across ge geographical locations across the clouds in one place mm -hmm. they have all the visualizations here yeah so they yeah. have full yeah. visibility or all their technical components and even the functional components and their help yeah. and uh, yeah. you know there are we can configure it with the red green blue and everything uh, if everything is fine green if there are uh, struggles uh, yellow and there is danger uh, red then and it can actually send emails to the administrators and they can take immediate action and even it, it can send uh, you know uh, requests or you know tickets mm -hmm. ticketing system to take care of okay this service is down immediate attention mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so everything is possible now mm -hmm. okay now yeah, the last piece i think <laughs> there's a cop okay you need security yeah since the application is so huge and the data there is a lot of confidential and secure data so you need to apply security starting from the application level then mm -hmm. the bridge level your container level your network level yeah and you and, uh, and in and you are you know yeah, every component every component because you have a, a multiple cloud e each cloud level your security configurations mm -hmm. are level so application mm -hmm. level container level your ec2 instance your uh, virtual machine level your network mm -hmm. level cloud uh, vpc level when cloud level and even your a request level api gateway level everywhere you can put uh, devops you you're, you can put security you have to put the security mm -hmm. depending on who can access and who can well, how can uh, you know you prevent all the data breaches mm -hmm. okay so the one main thing is that okay inside the pipeline you applied you know auditing mm -hmm. history auditing mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. apply uh, even uh, sonar cube is one one place Mm -hmm. And you applied, you injected monitoring, monitoring tools inside the pipeline. So mm -hmm. even check and monitor the health of your pipeline, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not just the health of your uh, this thing um, services. Even the pipeline okay. is the pipeline mm -hmm. about to break. Then uh, are we in, uh, on a danger of not being able to deploy on time? Mm -hmm. So okay. and it, even at your uh, uh, this level, the uh, Kubernetes level, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have so many configurations, right? So your configuration level, yeah, so your and some of the Ansible playbooks you can actually configure to every build it will go and check at the infrastructure level. Is this port, port secured for this kind of services? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything, everything you can go check and make, make sure that, okay, all your security settings are okay. Then it gives a, a green signal, then, uh, then only it can go. So. The real concept of quality checks or quality gates at the pipeline mm -hmm. level you can apply. Yeah. Okay. So, many different types of uh, tests called uh, static application uh, security testing. Uh, you might have heard about something called OWASP. OWASP is a standard or you know global globally accepted standard protocol or, or maybe a compliance level for the security. Mm -hmm. In yeah. which uh, yeah. define the two different types of uh, security tests. One is SAST. The other one is DAST, Dynamic Application Security. Okay. SAST is mainly for the, including the SAS, the static code analysis is one among them. Mm -hmm. So yes. static level, like a while, while it's not running, what is the security check? While it is live at runtime, that is dynamic one. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can attach all the security tests in the pipeline and it can give you okay. a go or no go. Okay. Okay. So that's about uh, your DevSecOps. So this is where uh, DevOps combines with the security, or security combines okay. with. The, so it becomes part of uh, the, your pipeline, your culture. So they mm -hmm. they, they profess that okay, security is from should be from the beginning, from early on. Mm -hmm. From the beginning, you should take care of the security. So that what are the whatever the security things you have to do, you do it declaratively. You know everything mm -hmm. from the. Beginning. And it's already in your code. So no human being is actually taking care of the security. It is the machines. And you declare yes. it. And you have full, full control. Yes. And from the beginning, for the whole team, for the whole team, it should, they should be aware these are the security measures we have. And these are the security standards we have. So this is one area where Agile and DevOps come into the play. Because one of, one of the biggest goals of DevOps is to have full picture about the production for even for the developer, for a junior developer, so that he can mm -hmm. develop according to that uh, uh, production requirements. 
so the, that is cross uh, you, you know uh, cross domain expertise of the uh, self organizing team concept of agile so mm -hmm. agile every, everyone is one team previously the whole development yeah. is one in agile now with yes. the advent devops even the operations team or also they are also being considered as part of the development team so they yes. know the concerns including security uh, of the production to the developers developers know these are the security requirements of the uh, this thing mm -hmm. uh, and they code uh, in fact it is the devops engineer but potentially the developers know looking at the code okay these are the security applied in the production yes and container level security. So you can harden the security of your uh, applications at the container level. Mm -hmm. So there are tools to actually test that. Mm -hmm. So you can apply this container level security in the, your uh, Docker files. You apply mm -hmm. it. And then uh, finally, um, from the container level, you, while it is running on your machine, it is fully secure. Mm -hmm. So you can apply it uh, mm -hmm. early on. And uh, so, yeah. Wh why do we? Wh which are the areas we? Um, which are the areas we protect? One is for the intrusion. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, can you know, from any hacker, can intrude any service. You know, so you can prevent at the container level, at the secure okay. level, and everywhere. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, like a neutralize uh, wherever there is a security threat, you can neutralize it. You can block it, or you can report it. Even you know, and so, so it will finally it will make your application super strong. So that's the end of the story. Yeah. So we are just recapping here. The okay. many books. Yeah. So okay. many books. Initially, the they started as a simple application with a simple Java, <laughs> Angular, and a PostgreSQL application. Yeah. And then the team grows. They they started with the collaboration tools like Git and GitHub. That's the start mm -hmm. of the culture. Okay. And yes. the bigger DevOps uh, one, uh, you know. Uh, uh, improvement was basically CI CD pipelines using mm -hmm. they reduced, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they automated the build and deployment. Mm -hmm. Then, yes. since the, the uh, infrastructure was not good, they migrated into cloud. Now it is scalable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, yes. uh, since the application was not scalable, they converted into microservices and they yes. utilized or leveraged a containerization using uh, Docker and Kubernetes to support it. Yeah, and yes. then. They wanted to automate the infrastructure creation and maintenance using infrastructure as code, mm -hmm. tools like Terraform, Ansible, and cloud-specific ones. Okay, and then advanced observability. They wanted to see everything, so I just omitted the cloud, uh, multi-cloud thing here. Observability. They made everything observable. Then the security mm -hmm. integration. They, they integrated security into the whole DevOps pipeline and from the development lifecycle. Yes. And uh, finally, you know, all this helped uh, Medibooks become a global leader in the healthcare industry. So that's the story. Did you enjoy the story? Yes. Oh, story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously, it was good. The way you explained the story and the lecture was really impressive. I'm just wondering how you are preparing in such a way because I have already uh, done a previous course in Chennai uh, institution. Yes. It was like they'll be giving some assignments and they'll be explaining story, blah, 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 like this. But this is really great thing because I can uh, see the entire architecture. I can imagine the architecture and the, how the workflow will be. So I can get into the workflow. So I can easily, if you give some task, I can imagine, okay, this is the workflow. This is how we have to connect with each services. So it's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really uh, uh, very much happy.